and welcome back to Creative Pet Keeping. My name is Kasha, I am your host, and today we're gonna continue the better breeding series. Oh, I got a boop. I got a boop from Littlefoot. She's hanging out over here. Got, oh, banana left. She got offended, but we've got Littlefoots. Look at all the stuff I got back there. We're gonna talk about better breeding supplies. So let's get started. Let's talk about tank size. When choosing your tank for spawning, keep in mind that the way we breed bettas in America, it will be different that they are bred in Europe, that they're different in Asia. So things will vary. So you can see some people can spawn bettas in tiny little containers, but if you're doing it in the US, it's gonna be a lot easier to go with either a five gallon tank, which is this size, or a 10 gallon tank, which is this size. Anything bigger usually doesn't work too well because the larger the space, the harder it is for the fry to find food. But also you don't want to get something too small because unless you're really good at maintaining your water parameters, you might run into some trouble. And while I'm trying to film this, Littlefoot is making biscuits on my carpet and rolling around thumbs up for Littlefoot's and her cuteness. When it comes to the spawning tank itself, what you need is some sort of filtration, a heater that is adjustable, a light. Now this is a cheaper light that I use. It's a Nicru light. You will also need some saran wrap or a glass lid for the top. I haven't put that on yet. And some sort of way to measure and maintain your temperature. In this case, I have this little probe, my little, um, Heater is not plugged in yet because I have no fish in here. So it is currently the temperature 76.3. If you want, you can also get a little temperature laser heat gun like this. This one's a little more accurate. So see 76.7 and now it jumped up to 77 over here. So you can always use two things to measure your temperature, it's always good to have more than one in case things are faulty. In terms of filtration, I'm trying out this new sponge filter, but usually I use ordinary sponge filters like this. The reason you want to use these kind of filters versus a hang and back filter, like this one, is because it has too much water movement for the fish. As you can see, this one's bubbling and having a bubble party in the corner but then the rest of the surface is very still and undisturbed, which is what we want for spawning. It doesn't matter what kind of sponge filter you get. This is the smallest kind. There are bigger ones and nicer ones. The pro to this is besides filtering your tank, this will also have little tiny organisms that grow on here that later on your better fry will actually hunt and eat. So this actually becomes another food source. You will also need a grow tank anywhere from 10 to 20 to 50 gallons will work. When it comes to feeding your baby bettas, you have to have your live foods prepared ahead of time or at least have your supply of brine shrimp, if that's at the very least what you're going to get, well before you breed because sometimes shipping can be late and you don't want to be in a situation where you've got babies swimming around and they have nothing to eat. First of all, if you set up your tank ahead of time and run a light on there and have some live plants, you will start to have some infusoria, which the fry can eat. Another good food is to have vinegar eels, as well as these are um, microworms, I believe. Let me check the label. Oh no, these are banana worms. So I have banana worms right here. You can culture microworms as well, as well as vinegar eels. It's good to have at least one of them, if not as many as you can. In terms of a brine shrimp, make sure you have your brine shrimp eggs and make sure you store them properly. These are kept in the fridge and then I have another container that's in the freezer. Whenever you open them, if any moisture uh, gets into the bottle, your brine shrimp eggs will go bad faster. And to hatch your brine shrimp, you're gonna need some sort of salt that has no caking ingredients in it. And you also need a little bit of baking soda to hatch your shrimp. When it comes to hatcheries, there's a couple different kinds you can use. I like this hatchery quite a bit in terms of ease of use. So this is a labyrinth one and you fill it up with water that has salt and baking soda up to the line and you put your eggs all around and then you close it like this. The only light that enters is right here. So the brim shrimp which are attracted towards the light will go under over under over the uh, labyrinth 
and we'll gather over here and once they gather you can pick this up and scoop them out and get all the water out so this is pretty pretty convenient mine's really dirty because I've been using it quite a bit you can also use a normal bright shrimp hatchery which you uh, connect to an air pump you have a bottle as well as um, you put a heat some sort of extra heat source like a lamp with it I'll show you an example of that in a second but I like having two different types here is an example of another brime shrimp hatchery I've going on. This is the San Francisco Bay one, and then I used a, a Coke bottle. I'm using a lamp right here to heat it, and it is being powered by my big pump over there. When it comes to other foods, I like to get some stuff from um, Dr. Ken's. This is the premium growth meal for fry. It's super, super tiny as well as these little sticks. I forgot what they're called, but they're made from um, worms. I think, uh, what are they called? Earthworms, there we go. It's a little earthworm mix, and once the fry get a little older, they can nibble on this food. So that's fun to get. I've used this before at the very beginning with my fry, and I'm not really sure if this entirely works. It's kind of similar to this, but it's even f finer powder. So you're supposed to feed this like super, super early on to fry, but I'll link it down below just in case. And in terms of other cool foods, I like using the rapashi foods for fry when they're probably, I think, older than a month. They can start eating these. Uh, the rapashi spun and grow is pretty good, but it's really fatty, so I don't recommend uh, feeding it too long. I would say probably no more than to three month old bettas. After they're three months old, you, you want to cut them off with this stuff because it's too fatty for them. And there's also the rapashi grub pie, which is more meaty and buggy because bettas are carnivores, so they benefit from this kind of stuff. So I try to rotate and feed them a wide variety of food with, of course, the emphasis being on live food such as brine shrimp. Besides live foods and dry foods, it's always good to have a good supply of frozen food. So for starters, I like to have garlic guard. This is just a flavor enhancer for fish, and whenever I'm switching to new foods, I'll add this to kind of entice the babies to figure out that whatever I'm giving them is actual food. So this kind of helps out. Soaking um, frozen food in Vitachem is really good because it's got a lot of vitamins for your fish. So they benefit and they grow a lot better when they've got extra vitamins. I am switching over recently to Hikari. So I still have some more um, San Francisco Bay brand. I have their Beef Heart, which is pretty good for power growing babies, but I'm switching over predominantly to Hikari because I've heard a lot of bad stories about any other brands and how they maintain their foods. And Hikari has a three-step sterilization process, hashtag not sponsored, but I just want to go the healthy route, so the safe route. So I've been switching over. This is their bloodworms. Whenever I open a packet, I just kind of put it in a Ziploc bag. So I have their bloodworms. I have their spirulina and brine shrimp. And this is not so much for bettas because bettas don't really need spirulina. This is more for my cichlids, but the bettas would get a tiny bit of this. And then of course I have my normal brine shrimp, which would be for the bettas as well. And these guys are like, I see food. I see food, are you gonna feed me? Because we're ready, we're ready to eat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break off a piece. There you go, guys. Oh, bonus, cute, eating. Got some Placida Chromas. The ones with the stripes are Julia Chromas Regani. And we, oh, that's my finger. And then we also have a little baby Electric yellow right there from the previous spawn. He survived in here and now he's just hanging out with everyone. They're all friends. I'm gonna drop this for you guys so you can go ham and eat your food. Cute little bonus footage. In regards to medications, it's better to have medicine on hand than to panic and try to find out where to get it if you do need it. Um, excuse the mess, I kind of spilled a little bit over here. One of the things that is very good, if you don't get any of this, I recommend having methylene and blue on hand. Not only is this pretty good medication that is fry safe, but you can also use this to hatch fry in case your male doesn't want to tend to his eggs. He doesn't have to raise them, you can raise them yourself. I haven't tried this myself uh, in terms of raising, but there are videos on that on YouTube so you can look them up. 
Paragard is a pretty good medicine and it's very, very gentle, so I like having it on hand. And in case I would get ick or velvet, uh, usually if you have velvet, man, fry are delicate, but if you have velvet, probably that could kill off all your fry. But it's good to have some medicine on hand. One, oh, I got stuff on my hand, oh no. But one preventative for velvet is if you use one tablespoon of salt, a cream safe salt, per five gallons of water. That will actually help prevent the parasite from kind of multiplying and spreading because it doesn't like water with salt in it. It's also good to have erythromycin or at the very least general cure is pretty good. A thing I've added to my repertoire of fish breeding stuffs is polyfilter. Not only is this great because this will absorb a lot of things as you can see right here. But it is also great for jarring, so let's say if you're going somewhere for a weekend or, or a couple days and you're jarring your fish, if you cut little pieces of this stuff and put it in the jars, it will help improve the chances of your fish doing well. Also, if you're paranoid about your tank and you're breeding for the first time, putting a little bit of this uh, into your spawning tank will also prevent you know, issues with ammonia or other things, so if you're worried this just this is nice. This is nice, and I like having it on hand for sure. Uh, oh, I almost forgot a very very important thing. Oh my gosh, you need some sort of water conditioner. Usually I use Prime. Recently I switched to Safe only because I have a lot of tanks. Just, there's a lot of tanks, so this stuff is in powder form. It's more concentrated, so it gives me more bang for my buck. But uh, Safe is pretty good to use for making sure that your water is, as the bottle says, safe for your little baby bettas. As your baby bettas reach sexual maturity, they will start to fight, especially the males. So you're gonna need to jar them temporarily before you sell them. Uh, there's a lot of options when it comes to jarring. You can go for an actual jar, which where the term comes from. This is a normal uh, pickle jar or pasta sauce jar. This is a larger one So you can already start saving your jars when you buy things at the store Clean them hold on to them. They'll be useful. You can buy containers at different stores I got this at Walmart this I got from one of the members of my local fish club He bought these big food containers used up the food and gave the containers to me. These are pretty nice They hold a lot more water which means you can get away with doing uh, water changes not as often. This is like every other day. This you can probably get away with like changing water maybe once a week or twice a week. And then there's the good old beanies, the Beanie Baby containers. Uh, the company that I was recently uh, showing off that put these back in stock, I don't think they're selling them anymore. So, which was really cool. I mean, they were really cool, so it kind of sucks. I drilled a little breathing hole here for the bettas, they have a nice little lid. For the most part, yeah, they do kind of scratch easily, so you have to be careful, but they're very clear and you will be able to see your fish the best out of these particular containers. So, but these are some options. You want to be prepared because you might, you know, have maybe get lucky and have a small spawn and need like 30 jars, or you might have a big spawn and you might need like 500 jars. So start collecting them now. It's better to have these now than to worry about it later. So thanks for watching my video. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you do, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Oh, Littlefoot is so cute. Littlefoot cuteness. That's gonna be in apparently every breeding video now. We're gonna have better breeding and Littlefoot. But I hope you guys subscribe. If you already haven't, be sure to check out my 2017 as well as the 2018 better breeding series. If you already haven't, and I'll see you in the next video. Just uh, sitting here at my desk. And um, my supervisor is here. She's telling me to go to work. Clearly I'm not working hard enough to earn our family cat treats. You're gonna fall, you're gonna, oh my gosh, little foot. You're dead. That wasn't very graceful. Please pet. No, please pet. Yeah. Oh. 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 Oh.